Well, this is just not sensible mathematics. 
<laughs> sensible mathematics involves neglecting a quality when it's small. And not, you know, not neglecting it because it's infinitely big and you just don't want it. <laughs> but it's a reasonable, reasonable thing to say. Um, and even so, here is another quote by Feynman, Richard Feynman, who was one of the people who actually developed this, uh, this theory, said the shell game that we play is technically called renormalization. Uh, but no matter how clever the word, it's still what I would call a DP process. So, you know, so people thought there was something that, you know, it sounds a bit fishy somehow because you just will replace these infinities by finite numbers in an ad hoc way. Um, but then it worked extremely well. So actually, I mean, you can make uh, predictions with quantum electrodynamics, and there are certain quantities that are. Um, measurable by experiments and that were actually <coughs> verified experimentally within you know, nine digital factors or something like that. So you can make extremely precise predictions and they actually work out. Um, and so actually the way, so then people understood a bit better you know, what was going on. And well, roughly speaking, the idea is the following. So the idea is to say, Okay, so the, the theory that you wrote down to start with, um, actually maybe it's not really valid when you look at what happens at very, very, very small scales. Right? So it's maybe valid only at somehow the scales, the length scales of which you make these experiments and these predictions. But maybe if you go down to really, really, really tiny scales, the theory is actually just rubbish. Um, and so we don't really know what happens at these small scales. Um, and so we would like to say that, well, in some sense, it shouldn't really matter what happens there. Um, but obviously, if we just use the theory that we start with, then it just gives these infinite answers, which says that that theory is obviously somehow not the right thing. It just gives these infinite answers. And so the idea is to replace it. You see, these infinities, they always came from sort of trying to integrate some functions have some singularities, and these singularities always appear in some sense when things are very close to each other. So they appear when you start looking at what happens at very small scales. And so the idea was to say, well, at very small scales, the theory is kind of rubbish anyway. Um, so we just change it. And so we change it by something you know, which is such that these integrals don't diverge anymore. Well, so then they don't diverge, but they're just replaced by some really, really big number. Uh, which is maybe not such a good idea either because you know, we give you predictions that, are, um, that don't really match with the experiment. <coughs> but then the, the genius idea is to say, well, now if you look at the parameters in the theory, maybe um, you can make some of these parameters actually very, either very small or very big as a function of you know, how you mess around with things at very small scales, right? So you say, okay, so I have this theory which sort of breaks down at very small scales, so I fix some very small scale and I make some kind of regularization below that scale. The exact value of the scale is essentially irrelevant, but it's just some very, very small number. And now, as I let that number go to zero, because all the somehow, the answers that the theory gives me start to diverge, they start to go to infinity. But that's actually because I've, essentially, I've sort of fixed all the constants appearing in the theory. And now the idea is to say, well, maybe I can make these constants also depend on these very small scale at which I regularize things. And if I do that in just the right way, maybe I can do it in such a way that things sort of cancel out and we get finite predictions. Um, and that's exactly what you can do and de facto, the effect of that is essentially the same as what they did in the beginning, which is to just say, well, replace the infinities by finite numbers. Okay, but you kind of understand the detail of what's going on. Uh, and it actually works extremely well. So for example, this, uh, the standard model is essentially the best, the best theory at the moment for, in some sense, the whole universe to understand how nature works, except for gravity. Um, 
to a field, but if you just sort of try to understand on small scales how subatomic particles work, there's this standard model which essentially describes everything. Um, and uh, Toft was depicted here, who got the Nobel Prize in the late 90s or something, um, for precisely showing that for this standard model, you can actually do these choice of parameters in such a way that you get finite predictions. Uh, and these predictions work extremely well. So that's what's, what's used in CERN in order to you know, make predictions of the LHC. Um, now, so let me try to show you by a sort of more concrete mathematical example what's the sort of thing that's going on. Okay, so take the following example. So take the function one of our absolute value of x. Okay, so that's just a function that looks like this. And that's one of these functions that's just not integrable, right? So maybe learn that if you try to integrate one of the absolute value of x, well, you get something like log x, but then if you try to evaluate log x between any number and zero, you always get infinity, because log of zero is minus infinity. Okay, so this is one of these functions that you can't, you can, it's all fine everywhere, but it's not fine at zero. Um, and so what you want to do is you want to still, in some sense, define what you mean by the integral of this function multiplied by any sort of nice smooth test function. Now, if that nice smooth test function happens to vanish at zero, then there's no problem, right? Because the reason this is not integral is because it's all diverges at zero, but if you multiply it by something that vanishes at zero, then things kind of cancel out, and so there's no problem. So we know how to uh, integrate it against the function that vanishes at zero. And so you want to now find a sort of consistent way of defining the integral of that guy against the function which doesn't vanish. And so how do you do that? Uh, so one way you could do it is the following. Right? So instead of looking at the integral, so you take some nice function phi. And so instead of what you would want to define in some sense is this integral of phi of x of x. And this is if phi of 0 is not 0, that's just infinity. So what you could do is you could subtract here something times phi at 0, where this something is just any function which is 1 via 0 and then goes to 0. Okay, so if you do that, then now at zero you get phi of zero minus phi of zero, so it vanishes. Okay, so it cancels out not the divergence of that guy, um, and you get finite answers. And the other thing you see is that if phi of zero happens to be zero already, then you haven't changed anything. All right, so in those situations where you, we already have, you know, a nice way of computing an answer, we haven't actually changed anything. Right? So if phi of zero is equal to zero, then this thing drops and you're just computing the integral of phi of x. Okay? Um, and now the other thing we also notice is that there's, a, there's some freedom here, which is that there's a choice of this function, this function has. So that I didn't say what it is, it could be sort of anything which is one near zero and then goes to zero at infinity. Uh, you can choose it any way you want. And actually, if you take two different choices and you look at how this differs, it essentially just differs by a constant times phi at zero. So in some sense, the different choices, uh, they are all parameterized by just one constant. You want this sort of a one parameter family of choices. Okay? And that parameter, it's a little bit like what I was explaining earlier, where you sort of replace infinity by some finite value. And that finite value would be how the value of this parameter. Okay. Um, okay. So now let me jump to a different example where something a little bit similar happens, but which is completely different context. So now we're not doing quantum field theory anymore. We're doing finance. Um, so in finance, well. So there's one basic object that people use a lot, which is called Brownian motion. Or, and Brownian motion is just a limit of random walk. So random walk is the following thing. You just start from a point, and then you make a step. And so it was some 
probability you go left with some probability you go right, and you do it in such a way that on average you don't move. Okay? So on average you stay where you are, but you always move so either to the left or to the right, but with average zero. Okay? And now let me call sort of psi t just the size of the t step. Okay? And it's positive if you go to the right, negative if you go to the left. Um, and then you make this random walk, which is of this good time. Um, but you scale it in such a way that instead of doing these steps every time, so every one unit of time, you do it every epsilon unit of time, or some very small epsilon. So if you want to do it very fast. And so in you know in terms of in finance, the epsilon would be what they call a tick, so it would be something like a few seconds or a few minutes. Um, and this size of the stack would be something like a price change. Right? And you, if you rescale this in the right way, so if you put it here a square root of the same epsilon, which is the time that you have between two successive steps, then actually for small epsilon, this converges to a, a limiting continuous function. It looks like this. Okay, so here you don't see the individual steps anymore because they're really tiny and they happen very, very frequently. And so you just see something like this, which kind of looks like a stock price. Right? Um, now, actually, the, um, the actual model of stock price is not quite what I just explained. And for the following reason, well, first, this thing there's no reason, you know, it can become sort of arbitrarily positive and arbitrarily negative, and of course stock prices usually don't go negative. Um, well, no. um, so, and the other thing is, of course, you know, so if your stock is worth one pound, right, then by how much is going to move in the next few minutes or few hours, well, maybe a few tenths. Now, if the stock happens to be a stock which is worth a thousand pounds, right, then maybe in the next few minutes or hours, it's actually going to move by a few pounds. Right? So the amount by which the value of the stock moves is not a fixed amount. It's actually proportional to the value of the stock itself. Right? So it's typically a certain proportion of the stock, which maybe moves by about 1% or 10% or something like this. Right? So what is what tends to be fixed is not the amount by which it moves, but the relative amount, <coughs> uh, the fraction of its value. And so for a stock, stock price, a better model is this model, right? So that's how the stock price of time t plus epsilon is the one at time t, uh, where you multiply it by one plus you know, so the same little amount by which the thing moves. Okay? So here now it's a little bit like the random walk, but the amount by which you move is proportional to the value itself. And so now, let's see how this, now if you send epsilon to zero as before, you would like to have some way of relating the stock price S <coughs> to this strong emotion value. <coughs> now, if you look at this, um, and you put this on the left hand side, this is a little increment of S, which is equal to S times this is the increment of this psi times two epsilon, and psi times two epsilon is actually the corresponding increment of w. <coughs> this I can rewrite it like that, right? So, so the little increment of s is equal to s itself times the corresponding corresponding increment of w. Uh, and now this suggests this looks a little bit like a differential equation, right? So it sort of suggests that I should just divide through here by dt or something, and then it looks like the s over dt is equal to s times the w over dt, and this you can solve. And the solution to this would be just s0 times the exponential of w. Okay. And this is actually wrong. Okay, so, the, uh, so if you take this model here, uh, and you let epsilon go to 0, then what you get is not s0 times the and there's an easy way of seeing that, which is that if you look at, if you take expectations on both sides, so if you look at the average stock price, since I said that the average 
of this little step is zero. Well, that tells you that the average price of time t plus epsilon is the same as the average price of time t. Okay, because these guys, the steps, are assumed to be all independent. And so whatever that guy is, it only depends on the steps that we made before, and so it's going to be independent of the next step. And so, so the average amount by which the S changes is just zero, just like the W. Okay, so S is going to stay constant on average. Um, whereas if you compute the average of the exponential of WT, well, it's you know, some explicit calculation one can do, and the answer is that it actually grows exponentially. Um, and so it cannot be, you know, it can't be right. So this formula cannot be right, okay, because we know a priori that this guy on average stays constant, and the exponential of the W on average grows. Um, and as a matter of fact, one can prove that uh, as epsilon goes to zero, this guy converges to almost the same thing, but there's a correction there. So it converges to exponential of WT minus zero. And again, so there's a little bit of a similar flavor here in the sense that if you, you know, this here looks a bit like an approximation to this differential equation. If you look at different sorts of approximation to the same differential equation, then typically what you get in the limit is something of that type with a different constant than a half here. Okay, so sometimes the minus a half would be maybe a plus a half or a zero or whatever, depending on what kind of approximations you take. Um, and so that's some sense, it sounds a little bit like what we had before in the sense that, you know, where we have some infinities appearing, and then when this, you want to get rid of it, and by getting rid of it, in some sense, you introduce a new parameter, because there's some sort of, you have to fix the value of the infinity, and that gives you a new parameter in the model. Okay? And it's actually, again, in some sense, the same story here, even though it appears to be completely unrelated um, to it. So, so why did it go wrong? Okay, so I gave you an argument of why, why the answer had to be wrong, which is that on average we knew that S doesn't change the exponential of W does. But that's not an explanation. Uh, the explanation is that actually the, well, you see when you formally start to write this like a differential equation, well, you do as if you were actually allowed here to multiply s with the derivative of w. Okay, but you remember the w also looks like this. Okay, and this doesn't look very nice and smooth, right? So it's not differential at all, actually. But it's, all, you know, it's, it's very jiggery. Uh, and it turns out that it simply doesn't have a slope at any point. Okay, so it doesn't actually have a derivative at any point. Uh, so this quantity doesn't really exist as a function. So if dw by dt doesn't exist, it's not differentiable. Uh, and so it's not clear what one actually means by this product here. Okay, and so it turns out that in this case, well, depending on how you approximate this product, well, you get different answers with it. Okay, and so, it's, so the reason why you get a sort of slightly counterintuitive answer here is because of this fact that you know, you're looking at things that are very wrong. Um, so the moral of the story here is that if you have, if you're dealing with very rough objects, very sort of singular objects, um, then the answer that you get, well, you see, what you usually do in mathematics <coughs> is you sort of define, if you don't know how to define something intrinsically, directly, you try to find some sort of approximation, and then you know you try to show that this approximation converges to a limit, and then you define your object as being a limit. And then you have to somewhere argue that the limit doesn't really depend on how you approximate things. Uh, and here is an example where the limit does actually depend on how you approximate things. Okay? And so the moral of the story is that when you're dealing with these very singular objects, then very often it's the case that the limits do depend on how you approximate things. 
but very often not too much, in the sense that you know you end up with a say a family of possible limits that depend on a few constants, but it's you know a family that you can both describe. So it's not you can't obtain anything. You just obtain one member of a family that just depends on a few constants. So like here, the, you would always, whatever you do, essentially you always converge to something of that type, and it's just that that constant has to change, depending on how your process is. Okay, so now here's the so the last example I wanted to talk about is the universality. And so this is now going to what uh, Oscar was mentioning in the beginning. But, uh, so what is universality? So universality, again, is the idea that um, when you look at many systems, especially random systems, when you look at them on large scales, then what you see doesn't really depend on the details of what happens on small scales. Okay? So it's like for this the stock price, for example, you have this random walk when you rescale it, you look at large scales and it converges to this continuum object, which is called plane motion. And that's true, essentially, whatever the distribution, you know, whatever the mechanism of how you make your random stack. So it doesn't matter whether it's, you know, with probability a half, you go one to the left, and with probability a half, one to the right. Or maybe you could go with probability a third, two to the left, and with probability two thirds, one to the right, and then still average zero. So for, as long as it's average zero, uh, you get the same object in the big. Well, excellent condition of not much. Um, and this is conjectured to be true much, much more generally. Okay, so for all sorts of systems. And so one example of these systems are these interface growth models. So, so here are actually two uh, real experiments. So the, the first one is the experiment of the burning sheet of paper. Okay? And so what you show, what you see here is the position of the flame from as a function of time. So the different lines are the positions of the flame from at successive times, okay, as it sort of moves up here. Um, and the one on the right is kind of a similar experiment, but instead of burning a sheet of paper, um, you have some liquid crystal that comes in two different phases, uh, and one phase is more stable than the other one, and you start in the unstable one, and then you somehow create the stable one, and then the stable one invades the unstable one. Okay, so you have two, if you want two different types of liquid crystal, and one of them invades the other one, and so you have again a front that separates the two, uh, and this is a picture of the position of the front as a function of time, where time is indicated in color. Right, so if you look at sort of the, the interface between blue and cyan is one particular time, and the interface between yellow and red is another time, etc. And well, so you, there are some features that are similar. So for example, you see here, one thing you see is that there's a little bump forming, and then the bump kind of spreads out. Right? So things don't just flat rate sort of like this, if you have bumps, lots of bump gets created, it actually tends to spread sideways. Uh, and here it's more difficult to see on that screen. There's actually a similar thing going on here. It's a bit difficult to see. Um, and so here are three different mathematical simulations of the, just three toy models uh, of interface tools. So the one in the middle is the sort of Petris model that Oslo mentioned, where kind of little boxes rain down from the sky and they stick to each other. Uh, and then you look at what happens at different times, and the time is in color. Uh, and then on the right and on the left, it's two different models that are sort of similar type of models. And you see, at small scales, they look very different. So for example, here you have holes because the boxes sort of stick to each other, uh, and so it, box sticks to another one, there might be still space underneath, but it will get, never get filled because anything that wants to fall in gets sticks on the blocks above. Right? Uh, so here you have holes, whereas in these you don't have holes. Uh, and then in one of them, so if you look closely here, you see that the overhangs 
the last one has no holes, so it has overhangs. That one doesn't have hole overhangs. Uh, so look, microscopically, they look quite different. But so on, you know, on the scale of the screen, they actually look pretty really similar. Right? And so that's what one conjectures. And unfortunately, so for any of these models, there's no proof of that whatsoever. So there has been uh, quite a lot of recent progress in analyzing some of these models that have some very particular mathematical features uh, that make them amenable to some explicit calculations. But for most of these models, one has absolutely no idea on how to prove uh, you know, that these things are similar on large scales. Now, the one thing that one does understand a bit better, on the other hand, is so what's called crossover regimes. So that's, so I, maybe I don't want to go into details of what this is, but it, so there are some models where you have a small parameter that you can choose. And for some value of the parameter, the thing actually behaves much more nicely. So in the case of these interfaces, what happens is that there are two types of interfaces. So there are the interfaces where you have one thing invading another thing. Okay? Like, for example, the, sheet, the piece of paper that burns. Once it's burned, it cannot be unburned. Right? So it can only go one way. You can't go back. Um, on the other hand, you can have interfaces between, I don't know, say water and ice. Okay? There it can go both ways. Right? Because water can freeze and ice can melt. Okay, so the interface can look, go into the water and you can also go back. Um, and so if you have an interface which is where the mechanism is completely symmetric, so you can kind of go back and forth, and it's not easier to go either way, um, then one understands quite well what happens. So then actually on large scales, uh, what you see is always something described by Gaussian distributions, and one has a very good understanding of what happens. Whereas when you have these interfaces that are not symmetric, where it's, so there's one region invading another region, um, then the fluctuations really look different, and one doesn't have an explicit description. And there's still, so one has some very partial description, but it's essentially still an open problem. And so now what you can do is you could have a situation where you're almost symmetric, right? So you're in a situation where sort of almost in the symmetric situation, but one region is a little bit stronger than the other one. Okay, so one of them is just a tiny bit stronger than the other one, and so it invades uh, the weaker region, but it invades it very slowly. And so in that case, you would think, well, then it should be very close to this Gaussian situation which one understands. But then you look at what happens at very, very large scales. And you look at scales which are sufficiently big so that you actually start to see a difference from the Gaussian situation which one understands very well. And in these cases, one can write down equations. And so you end up with these sort of partial, stochastic partial differential equations. Uh, so I don't want to go into details of what even the terms mean in this equation. Um, but let me show you a picture. So this is what the solution to these equations look like. Okay, so this would be the fluctuations of one of these interfaces as a function of time. You should think of the whole picture as kind of moving up in time, but then you know you don't want it to move off the screen immediately, so you actually move with it, and so it keeps on standing still. Okay, but you should really imagine that the whole thing is actually moving up, and it's just that you're moving with it. Okay. And what you see are just sort of the fluctuations of this interface. And you see a little bit of that feature that I was mentioning, is that when you have bumps forming, uh, then they tend to also spread sideways. So I don't know if you can see that. So here you have a bump forming, and you kind of spread, you see it sort of spreads up. Right? So you see them kind of spread sideways, as opposed to, for example, here, this would be the fluctuations of the symmetric interfaces, 
And in that case, things essentially just fluctuate up and down, and they don't. There's no, there isn't this mechanism that's playing sideways. Okay, so this is how these uh, objects look like for, as a function of space and time. And well, so here is another one. So here, so this one. Uh, so here we are not talking about interfaces. It's more about sort of fluctuations of the magnetic field <coughs> near what people call critical temperature. And here would be a magnetic field which points in one direction in the dark region and in another direction in the light region. And you see these dark and light regions sort of moving around. Uh, mm -hmm. But you see there's also sort of lots of noise, which means that actually locally, this magnetic field has sort of very, very wild fluctuations. Um, and so if you look at the, so, okay, so let me just talk about the first equation. I don't want to go into the details, but one thing that you see is that this equation involves the square of the derivative, the solution. Okay, and then, you know, remember that, whoops, the solution looks like this. And so in particular, it's actually, again, <coughs> as before, let me just freeze now. So, as before, you see that this thing is very, very rough, right? And so, as you, you can imagine that there isn't really a slope at any point of this graph. Okay, so it goes up and down like crazy. It doesn't really have a slope at any point. And so, writing down an equation where you have the square of the slope appearing seems to be complete nonsense, right? Because you don't really have a slope at any point. And if anything, the slope is kind of infinite at every point because it's very spiky, so it either goes up very steep or down very steep. And so on the face of it, that term should just always be infinity. So it doesn't really make any sense. Um, but then there is this constant here, and in some sense what happens is that one should really set this constant here equal to infinity to kind of cancel out the infinite part of the square of the grid. And now it's getting really kind of weird because you have, you know, you have an object here which doesn't really make any sense. It's all infinity everywhere and you subtract a big infinite constant. And then I'm claiming you should actually get something, you know, you shouldn't get zero. You should actually get some sort of fluctuating thing. Um, and this you can actually prove. So the way so the way you can make this more formal is a little bit like what I was explaining at the beginning. You sort of regularize things. You say you look at the model where instead of being infinitely steep or infinitely rough, it's sort of very steep. But if you look at some very small scale, which are called epsilon, below that small scale, you actually see that it happens to be smooth. Okay? And it's just that you're looking at much, much, much larger scales, and on the very large scale, it's very rough. But if you zoom in a very small scales, now it becomes smooth. Okay, so you change it into that model, and it's just that in the limit, there's the idealized model in which you know that small scale has gone to zero, and the thing is sort of infinitely rough at every scale. Um, and now, what happens if you do that? Well, the theorem is that you can. You can take the limit epsilon going to zero, make this constant go to infinity at the same time, and if you do that in exactly the right way, you go to a limit. Um, and the well, if you want the interesting part of the theorem, is mostly that the limit doesn't depend on how you, you know, what you actually do at the small scales. Okay, so in principle, there are lots of choices of what you can do at these very small scales. Um, but the theorem says that it doesn't really matter what you do, uh, the limit you get is actually always the same. So in that sense, there's really just sort of one uh, canonical object that you can build. Now, okay, so let me skip this. So let me just say a few words on the idea of how to prove this. And so the main idea <coughs> is to, you know, you've all learned about Taylor expansions, right? So you know that if you have a smooth function, then 
well, at every point, first it has a value, then it has a derivative, the second derivative, etc. And you can sort of approximate better and better by first just its value, and then the tangent line, which has the same value and the same slope, and then by a parabola, the further more has the same curvature, and then you can you know, take the polynomial of degree three, four, etc. And you get better and better approximations around every point. Right? So that's what you do when you do a Taylor expansion. Um, in, in these equations, well, you know, we've seen what the solutions look like. There's a very rough and wild object. You don't have a Taylor expansion anywhere. Okay, so you have values, but then you already don't have a slope. Um, and so then you're stuck. And, well, so the, the idea here is to say, you see, in the Taylor expansion, we kind of try to approximate things by polynomials. And, well, really, in this case, using polynomials is not a good idea. And so what you should do, what you can actually do in this case, is that you can find a collection of functions or distributions, in some case, here would be functions, um, which are which has to sort of just the right shape so that still locally the solution does look like some sort of position of these functions. Okay, just like for a smooth function, you can write it as a superposition of a constant plus a linear function plus a quadratic function, etc. So here you have something in between, which is from something very squiggly, uh, you know, which plays the role of some sort of take a monomial of degree a half. Uh, and then there would be other terms of, you know, maybe degree one other than just the linear one. Okay. So you, you can build a number of objects that play a similar role to the Taylor of polynomials um, so that at every point you can actually approximate the solution up to basically any order you want by some linear combination of these objects. And the nice thing is these objects, you can build them a priori without having to solve an equation. Yeah. Um, and then the idea is to say, well, you know, I want to somehow make sense of the square of the derivative of this thing, which doesn't really have a derivative anywhere. And so what you do is you say, well, OK, so locally, it's described by you know, this superposition of very rough functions that I can build. Um, with some coefficients that I don't know. That's what the solving the equation will tell me what the coefficients are. And so then if I want to sort of, you know, build the square of the derivative, all I have to do is I have to somehow figure out how to multiply the derivatives of these rough objects. Okay, so it's sort of intuitively, it's kind of clear that if your solution looks like some linear combination of Know, these five objects yeah, at any point. And if I know somehow how to multiply the derivatives of these five objects with each other, then I should also know how to multiply the derivative of the solution with itself. Right? So essentially all I have to do is I have to figure out the consistent way of multiplying the derivatives of these five objects. And that will tell, give me a consistent way of actually taking the square of the derivative of anything that locally looks like these objects. Okay, and then I can try to solve the equation in some you know, space of things that locally look like these five objects. And it turns out that that's what you can actually do. So that's the, uh, that's the idea. So in some sense, even though you know, these things look very rough, in some sense they are smooth sense that at every point you have something like a Taylor expansion with a remainder which is smaller pretty much any order that you want. You can go, if you go far enough, you can make the remainder as small as one. Um, and the objects that play the role of polynomials in this Taylor expansion, they are things that you can you can guess them a priori. You don't have to solve an equation. Okay, so, so let's let me just conclude with a few remarks. So, Say so one moral of the story is that in uh, you know this idea which comes from quantum field theory, which is uh, 
sometimes things look like they don't make any sense, and then what you do is you just add some terms in the equation, but with constants that become infinite some way, uh, and you do it in the right way so that things cancel out and give finite answers. Uh, that actually works also in models from you know, probability theory or statistical mechanics, like these interface models. Um, and well, so then what happens is that, so in general, whenever you have one of these infinities appearing and you can somehow deal with it, then that gives you additional parameters in your model. Because essentially what you're doing is like what we said at the very beginning, is you kind of replace the infinity by a finite value. And that gives you sort of additional parameters in your model. Um, and so one of the things that one would want to do. So for the moment, one can prove a number of things. So there's a general theory uh, that allows to deal with these type of equations and things like that. Um, it, it's very much, at the moment, it's very much a continuum theory. So it's for the experts in the audience. Uh, one would like to apply it to actual you know, discrete models of statistical mechanics or things like that. It doesn't seem to work so well for these type of models for the moment, but that's I think I should stop here. Thank you very much.